We are headed into our second presentation for today. We have uh, Elizabeth Stewicki, um, I call her Liz, and I was very intentional to make sure I wrote Elizabeth in the like Zoom invite to be a panelist because I also acknowledge that um, we seem to be the only ones that call you Liz. And so um, <laughs> Liz is a RBT and she's been with Del Mar for how long? Almost Two years? Almost, yeah. Um, she uh, started with us as a new RBT, it's like brand new to the field. She has a his, uh, background in theater um, and performing arts. And she really quickly took to not only the science, but the humaning part that Megan talked about, that I've talked about in a variety of ways. And I hope, I hope you all are hearing in your organizations that we have to human first. And if we don't do that well, nothing else matters. And so... Um, Liz quickly uh, became a leader at Del Mar and became one of our senior RBTs, which is the language that we use for sort of our peer support program. The program sounds so official and I am doing the best I can each day, but a program sounds far more pulled together when in actuality, a lot of times we're building the plane as we're flying it. And I think that kind of has a negative connotation to it. What I've worked to reshape it is that we really at Del Mar, and I hope in your organizations, we build the supports around the teams that we have. So there were other times we needed a different type of RBT support committee or a different, different duties were in there, or it was graduate students instead of our RBTs. So it, it just really is about building and creating what each team needs. And the same team at Del Mar changes because the only thing constant has changed. So even if Del Mar is the same, us as humans are different one day to the next. And so um, Liz has just really done an exceptional job at this. And, and one of the things that we've talked about all month long um, is the importance of support, support at work, support outside of work. Um, and I think sometimes I take for granted that I'm in a decision-making position at our organization. And so um, I can decide we're going to do this or we're going to have this. And, and what if you aren't, right? And so I would gently challenge you to bring those conversations up to supervisors to see how you can make it happen. And each of us can be the change we want to see in the world. So, so while we'll talk about some formal and uh, some formal ways to do that, we also can talk about how you can apply these strategies to be a peer support, right, to support the RBTs in the organization within which you work, even if the decision makers are not open to implementing a formal program, or you can choose to make a change in, in where you're working. So um, Liz, take it away. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about peer support in the workplace. Um, oftentimes, BCBAs aren't always readily available. It's nice to have um, somebody that is your peer that you can kind of go to with um, questions, problems, whatever you may have. So that's kind of what we've done at Del Mar. Um, and I can't switch my slide while I'm sharing my screen. Hold on. I'm doing something wrong. No, nope. click on. I can just do this. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So um, what does peer support mean to you? If you guys wanna just share in the chat what peer support means to you, that would be awesome. And then I'll kind of go into what it means for us. And there's the chat. Liz, if it's helpful, I can monitor the chat too and read some of the things out as they come in, if that's one less thing to monitor. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. And, and if this is a term that's new to you, feel free to share that too. Because I it's kind of like with therapy and ABA and even autism, I sort of live on this planet so much that I, I forget it might be new language for, for folks. And if you don't know, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. Shared experiences. Mutual understanding, striving to meet others' needs, talking through new experiences. These are awesome. Cool. So what I have is it's the process in which we give and receive encouragement and assistance in the workplace. Um, peer supporters share knowledge, teach skills where applicable, obviously. We're not BCBAs, so we want to stay within our scope always. 
um, make connections, create an environment that feels safe and comfortable to allow others to freely ask questions um, and bring up problems and concerns. So how do you build connections in the workplace or just in life? What are some strategies you use to build connections with people? You couldn't have planned this any better coming after Megan's yeah. five steps, right? That's so exactly I, I want to kind of draw attention to the fact that building those connections and relationships is first in, or building connection, right? Um, safety, security in any relationship comes first. You can feel free to type in the chat ways that you're building connections at work and, and maybe um, things that have worked for you. Maybe you've seen more non-examples than examples, and that's okay to put in the chat too, because I think sometimes what happens is, or at least for me, when I didn't have um, great supervision or support, I, I knew what I didn't want or what I didn't want to have or what wasn't working, which is half of it, but then I didn't totally know what to do instead. So we can talk both about examples and non-examples. So I'll just move along. Um, some examples that I can think of, getting to know colleagues on a personal level, if they're open to it, yeah. Asking how others are doing, if they need anything, getting a toy, yes, excellent. Um, so some things that I thought of when making this slide was, connecting beyond your normal task list. Um, so if you do see a coworker asking what they did that weekend, I love cats. If somebody remembered that I love cats or remembered my cat's name and said, hey, how's Gatsby doing? I would be thrilled and automatically feel more connected to that person. Um, making a point to conversate throughout work, a shared space to eat lunch, to have a short, lighthearted conversation. Um, we have a nice staff suite at Del Mar, so it is nice to go up there and conversate with people, follow up about something previously discussed. Um, you know, I, if I know Will likes bacon, we can I can bring up bacon. Um, offering praise and recognition. So noticing that somebody, that your peer is doing an excellent job and letting them know that they're doing an excellent job is a great way to build connections. And now I'm gonna talk about kind of some ways to praise. So something that Dr. Becca does at Del Mar, which I really love um, is throughout the day, if she is out in the clinic and she sees somebody using pre-MAC principle, she'll say, hey, nice use of pre-MAC principle, nice block, great job. Um, just acknowledging that you're seeing that person, you're seeing them doing an excellent job um, and you're saying something about it when you, seeing, when you see it happening. Maybe offering an ear um, to debrief following a difficult session. I saw that session was tough for you, you did a great job and I'm here if you'd like to talk after. Um, I think that at Del Mar, that's, we do that a lot. It's nice to know that it is a safe place. And if you do have a more difficult session, it's not something that you need to feel embarrassed about or what is a good session or, or, or a bad session. Um, no, it's in the locker, yep. Uh, so other ways to praise via email. If you don't feel comfortable sharing in person, you can send somebody a nice email. Hey, I saw you did you did this. Great job. We have a shout out board um, at both of our clinics. So we if we see, you know, you, you can thank somebody for anything on the shout out board. Thanks for, you know, bringing in those cookies or making my day a little better. Uh, great job working through some difficult um, behaviors. We also have Yammer, uh, which is basically like a, a Facebook, I guess, for the business. Um, and you can post on Yammer uh, and tag somebody in it. Hey, great job. Uh, post a little GIF, make a funny joke um, and stick it. Is that how you say it? Is it GIF? And I've been saying GIF and like no one's correcting me. It's GIF, I Googled it. It's GIF, like the peanut Oh butter. shit. <laughs> now, I, the more you know and yeah. Yay. Thank I you for enlightening it. me, Liz. Fabulous. <laughs> Um, however, we do want to be mindful of dual relationships. So how do you keep your relationships at work 
personal and professional separate. Um, if you want to write in the chat, have you ever, how do you do that? Have you ever struggled with doing that? Has, is it something you've never even thought about before? You always struggle with that, yeah. Labeling when I'm being boss, Dr. Becca versus regular old Becca, wanna be professional. Mitzi, I also struggled with that and in moving into a leadership position. I really had to learn how to set boundaries and be comfortable setting them and to open talking openly about them. Um, so what we do or what I do is label it, name it to tame it like Dr. Becca said earlier. This can be helpful so that other people know what rules are at play here. If I um, text, you know, somebody that I work with, hey, I'm coming to you as a friend. Do you have the spoons for this? Hey, I'm coming to you as a coworker. I need this done. Um, can really help kind of set that boundary. And like I said, let people know what rules are at play and why. We do hard work and keeping personal and professional relationships separate can help protect you against burnout and stress. I know there was another webinar about exactly that, about burnout and stress. And it can just, it, blurring the lines between personal and professional for me sometimes feel like I'm taking my work home with me if I'm unsure if somebody's reaching out to me as a coworker or as a friend and labeling it has really helped. I'm in New Jersey, so I went with this winter theme because it is cold. Um, so ways that Delmar provides peer support. I'd love to hear if, if your organizations do anything else. I do struggle a lot in my culture. Hugs and kisses on both cheeks is the norm. It's like saying hello. Yeah, for sure. So we have senior RBTs. Um, they're basically seasoned RBTs that provide support in a variety of different ways. So some of the ways that we provide support, we do offer support sessions when we're asked to by a BCBA. Um, if they're busy or if they, and, or if they know that we know the case or the kiddo really well, they may say, hey, are you available to jump in for a support session for 30 minutes? Um, and oftentimes newer team members feel more comfortable asking a senior RBT questions because we are your peer. Um, and it could be more, especially if you're newer to ABA, I mean, at least when I was, it was scary for me to ask a BCBA a question that I felt like I should know the answer to and I didn't want anybody thinking less of me. So oftentimes, I find that people are more comfortable coming to a senior RBT with a question. And obviously, if I don't know the answer to it, um, I'm keeping open communication with the BCBA, making sure that we're all on the same page. Um, check in often. So, so I feel like we check in with each other all the time at Del Mar. So every Friday we send an email. I have five people who are my check-in people. I send an email. How is your week as it relates to work? Um, and I think part of the reason that our, our communication and our rapport is so well at Del Mar is because sometimes if you get a check-in that's, um, you know, kind of out of the blue or you're not expecting, hey, can we check in? It can feel like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? Um, that is not how it is at Del Mar at all. We were constantly checking in with each other um, to the point where sometimes when people start, they're like, hmm, this is, yeah, it normalizes the process, exactly. We focus on building connections. So we do create an environment that feels comfortable and safe. Um, you know, I like to consider myself a people person. I like to have conversations and learn things about people. So I enjoy building those connections with my coworkers. And I hope that they feel safe to come to me with, with any issues or whatever they may need. We also provide clinic-wide support. So we're generally available in the clinic, um, whether somebody needs help cleaning up snack um, or we can provide some praise, some feedback, answer questions, even if it's not ABA related about, you know, maybe where the cleaning supplies are. Um, just general clinic-wide support. We're kind of, we're always in the clinic. We're basically a bridge between RBTs 
and BCBAs and other professional level, level staff. Um, because I don't know how it is at your organizations, but I know that there are some where you don't see your BCBAs a lot. Um, they're not easily accessible. So we kind of act as that bridge for our RBTs, specifically newer ones at Del Mar. Um, RBTs are the most vulnerable population in this field. And when we feel seen, heard, and supported, the whole team is able to function more efficiently. And then the last slide I have is that you are important and so is this job. RBTs are essential to meeting the demands for ABA therapy across the country. Um, and having that support and feeling supported and connected within each other is so, so, so critical to having a happy work environment. Um, so that's everything that I have about peer support. That's kind of what Delmar does for peer support. And like Dr. Becca said, she really does. We, we build our team based off of what, what the rest of the team needs. Um, I would love to hear how how your organizations, do they offer peer support? How is it offered? What does that look like for you? Um, Can I uh, ask some questions too, uh, Liz? I'm also over here tearful because I just really am just, you know, just very proud of you. Um, <laughs> you. And I think those of you who've spent time with me, you know that I cry easy. I've always felt my feelings really big. It feels extra big when I pour so, I'll just speak for me, I pour so much of myself into those that I'm mentoring or supporting. And so for me, the emotion is because, you know, Liz is not just a supervisee. She wasn't just an RBT. She's this human that I've watched learn and grow and expand and that I trust and that I value. And it's just a really powerful experience that can make our work feel richer. And I think somebody earlier in the chat had said about the parallel process of what we know works with our little learners, right? Uh, if we work in pediatrics or our adults, whoever our identified client is, we do a really good job of doing that stuff with them or usually a better job. And sometimes we don't do the same things that we know work with our supervisees. So, um, we, and, and we want to we want to do that. We know that it works. So we want to spend time pairing, building rapport, and building relationships with the kids and our staff. And we want to spend time honoring and and knowing what's important to them, like a preference assessment, with our staff, right? Our teammates, because then we feel safe at work. And when we feel safe at work, it feels more comfortable to be silly. And kids play and they're silly. Remember that video with Dr. Miller and her son Taylor. And so, Liz, I wonder. Um, one of the things that we had talked about when you first moved into the role was how did you start or what was it like when you first started giving folks feedback and supporting them? Because that's often hard for people moving into that space. Maybe the stories you told yourself and then how you um, maybe modified those stories to be kinder and more accurate. I definitely struggled with the feeling of who am I to be giving this person feedback? Um, are, are people even going to listen to to what I have to say, am I a lot of self-doubt? Am I good enough for this? Um, and honestly, a lot of conversations that were had with you, Dr. Becca, like, you know, you're in this role for a reason and we trust you and you do know these things. And if there's anything you don't know, I feel comfortable enough in our relationship to go to you and ask you. Um, but it was really working through a lot of, of self-doubt of kind of, well, well, who am I? Who am I to, to give feedback to other people? Um, and I think uh, feedback to me in my mind was, was a bad thing and it's absolutely not. I love that you said that, Liz, because that's also that idea when folks first start an ABA and they hear consequence as part of that three-term contingency and the consequences are bad. They're not, it's just whatever happens next. That's it. And so, so kind of acknowledging that you considered feedback or even those like, let's check in or, hey, can I talk to you for a minute that then makes people's heart, you know, go, their stomach go into their throat and their hearts pounding. And when we're checking in regularly, it's kind of reconditioning those to just be a normal part of your day. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
It's almost odd if we don't check it now. So that's exactly right. It's changing the narrative. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, those things happen one marble at a time. And that's how, or one dollar at a time, one coin at a time, that's how relationships are built. And relationships are the foundation for anything when you're humaning with other people. I mean, there's a relationship of some kind. It can be comfortable, it can be uncomfortable. And um, yeah, I think that's, I think in BCBAs being available, you know, we're on site all the time and we're not always available, right? So even that difference of, um, I might be around, but I'm not always available to ask questions. And our senior RBTs um, have less direct sessions so that they are available, that that's really part of the role. You know, you, you see some kids direct because that rules, we love it. And just like BCBAs see kids direct at Delmar because we never want to get too far from what we're supporting others in doing. Um, and the other part of your role is supporting others. So what, do you remember some of the things that we, I don't know how to ask that, but so we did the difficult conversations rotations together so that you and Sav were, you and Savannah were able to um, know how to have those difficult conversations if they came up, right? So let me kind of break that down differently. Um, if I'm asking you to do something, I need to give you the tools to do it. I can't just say, you're going to go do this. Good luck, right? In the same way that we have to give our kids the tools that they need in order to be successful. And so we had some direct instruction and and teaching. It was much more like a a workshop um, Mm -hmm. that we met every week. And we still meet every week talking about how are the, you know, we went, did a book study on the difficult conversations that we talked about in another session. Um, And we uh, really modeled how we hope for them to be with the RBTs they're supporting by being that way in our interaction, right? I'm not asking you to do something I'm not doing. And my hope is that by modeling that, you're seeing how that feels. And if that feels good and works, you'll be more likely to do that for others. For sure. And zooming out and, you know, not just, I'm not just thinking about me anymore. I'm supporting all of these other people. Um, which now is just, I mean, I couldn't imagine not doing that. So I've definitely grown a lot as, as a person, as a a leader. I always think, I think that I've always kind of been a natural leader, but I think that I kind of needed some grooming and I've definitely gotten that at Del Mar. And that that's because you were open to it. You know, we have had folks that we've offered this position to, and it doesn't end up working as well. And that's okay, right? So so maybe that's the other part is not everyone's meant to be a peer support, just like not everyone's meant to be a BCBA, not everyone's meant to be a psychologist, not everyone's meant to be a speech path. It's looking for the folks who have those, some of the skills, but really the desire to do that. And then helping them move into that role. So for us, we acknowledge that not everyone is gonna be a BCBA or BCABA or anything else. And that's great, right? RBTs are the most important and so we need them. And literature shows pretty clearly that when folks feel like there's nowhere for them to grow, uh, they feel crappy. And I don't want you to feel crappy. I don't wanna feel crappy. So we really worked intentionally to find ways that we can create these growth opportunities within our RBTs. And so the RBT is the credential, just like the BCBA is the credential. But the different job roles at Del Mar is not the same for all BCBAs, just like it's not the same for all RBTs. So it was important to us to really flesh out opportunities and pathways for growth for RBTs that was not just going to grad school. And so this was one of the ways that we um, kind of found to do that and the peer support um, I think is pretty helpful. Um, I know it's helpful for me as a clinician, as a BCBA, because I can't do all of it. Um, And I don't want to try. There's things that you offer as RBTs that I can't. I'm just, I just, I can't, not that I don't want to. My stimulus value is different. And by not acknowledging that, I'm doing a disservice to the RBTs I serve. For those of you that were at one of the other um, meetings, and um, I had, I've said it a couple of times, I think that if you're a Del Mar RBT and you're attending, I definitely want you to still participate. And I acknowledge that me seeing it, me being here might 
be a damper on that. So please send a direct message to Dr. Miller or um, Nora or, um, you know, Dr. Kelly, send direct messages. And I think by labeling that, I'm saying I acknowledge that my presence in this environment impacts it in some way, good, bad, or otherwise. And so I want to do what I can to minimize that so everyone can get what they need. Um, do you want to answer this one, Liz? Yeah. Was it difficult to become more than a peer at the same workplace you started? Um, so yes, that was definitely an adjustment. It was definitely a thought in my mind. And for me, I think it was shifting my mindset, um, shifting how I thought about myself at work. Um, I'm not, I'm not better than anybody because I'm in more of a leadership role. Um, I'm, I'm genuinely here for you. I genuinely want to build connections to help support as best as I can. And it was definitely, I, I remember saying exactly that to Dr. Beck though, like, well, how are, how are other people going to think of me? You know, are people going to listen to me or, or again, who am I? Um, so it was definitely, definitely an adjustment. And I think it was what I just needed to shift my mindset and how I thought about myself and, um, how I valued myself as, as an RBT and really thought, you know, I, I, I am good at this and I got asked this for a reason. And as much as I remember it being challenging for you, not one other RBT ever has said, gosh, why is Liz in that position? Why is Savannah in that position? Who are they? N no one. That's the story we tell ourselves, right? And that's that shit that gets us stuck. We don't even realize we're doing it. And it's so in our own way. Um, I think you saw the gratitude from Will for all of the support that you've provided. That's the kind of stuff that you heard because that's what was happening, right? It's, it's, we're viewing things different. And Anita, I think it's a great question because while this happens moving from an RBT to a senior RBT or a case coordinator, it also happens if you're an RBT and then you pass the exam and you are a student and you go to being a BCBA or a BCABA or from BCABA to a BCBA or um, any of those times that you change a role within an organization when you were previously in a different role, that's common. And so I think, I hope one of the helpful things that we do in this situation or when it's RBTs moving to BCBAs is we name it to tame it. Like that comes from Dr. Dan Siegel. I never, um, um, I've, I, I certainly didn't pick that up. He's far more clever than me, but it's so important because the story we tell ourselves is nobody else feels this way. Nobody understands. I'm dot, 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 right? Fill in what you want that to be that's just not true, right? It, or, or rather it's true for everyone. So still when people say doctor, I look around like, oh God, who are they talking about? And then I realize it's me. And I was, oh God, you better have something to say, Becca, you know? Or like, you know, I still see myself as the high school dropout that was in a residential treatment facility. You know, I don't, the way we see ourselves can really be a hindrance. And so stepping into that light, you know, like it's, it's, um, when are you enough? So I am fairly confident at some point I've said to Liz, if, if, you know, when she said, who would listen to me or why would they listen to me? Why wouldn't they? Or, or she said, I'm not ready. When will you be? And I was like, uh, yeah. So now, right. And, and there's so many times that we think that, there's a time in the future when we'll be ready. No, that's just avoidance. That's, that's avoidance. Now is good. Let me help you do it messily. And can I help you see you the way I see you? Which is this highly competent, thoughtful, compassionate, committed professional individual. That's what people need. And, and so that idea of when will you be ready? Now. Well, never. And so now. Right is important. And I think sometimes there's such a need for BCBAs that, and it's been the focus for so many organizations that the focus is that in order to move forward or up, whatever that means to progress, you must go to grad school and be a BCBA. I don't think that's the case. Um, it's not an option for everyone for a variety of reasons. And honestly, at many organizations, the job that you fall in love with as an RBT is 
eons away from what you do as a BCBA. And, and so it's almost like this bait and switch. It happened to me as a school psychologist. I loved being with kids. And then I uh, got licensed and I spent all my time in the schools with adults. And I was like, woof, this isn't what I signed up for. So it's important to me to help shape our field into focusing on ways for RBTs to expand their skill set that doesn't involve grad school. I see Anita said uh, specifically at our, or uh, the person in the senior role has less experience in education, so many hurt feelings. Mm -hmm. So I think um, there will be hurt feelings sometimes. And when we are intentional and thoughtful about our choices and we can explain them each time. So my guess is, and I, I don't know, I hate to make an assumption and I'm kind of going to because I see that happen. So I can totally be wrong and I'm open to hearing that. The decision to promote who we promote into those positions is one in a million of decisions that I make or that we make as a team. And I think, I hope in explaining my decisions each time I make them from something small to something big and eliciting feedback about what do you all think about this from small to big, I hope that our team trusts my decision. And so we don't have as much of that hurt feel. Look, people might be disappointed they got passed over or that they didn't get it. Passed over is sort of a crap word for it, um, that people didn't get it, but we have a good relationship and folks trust my decision-making, I think. So that doesn't really happen if they have a hard time that they didn't get selected, we can work through that. It's not that they're not gonna be disappointed and we make our decisions based on objective quantifiable data, all of our decisions. We take data everywhere, always and always. And so I, I believe that that makes it easier to understand those decisions. You may not like it and you can see where we're coming from. And so I think making sure that we're open and clear as leaders about the criteria that we're using to make these decisions helps move through some of that disappointment because the disappointment is normal. And even if you're disappointed and you can see where I'm coming from, it's not like a favorites game. You see where I'm coming from and that it's objective. That I think makes it easier because there's that trust, right? It goes back to that humaning. I mean, I'm always asking feedback. What do you, you know, we've got a hundred extra bucks this quarter. What do you guys want to spend it on? Or we're at the end of the year and, you know, seeking feedback for next year. What do we want to change about schedules? How's everyone feeling? What's working? What isn't? Here's what we spent our money on for our compensation package. Our folk, I have the data that shows, you know, nobody's really using this. Do we want to get rid of it and spend that money in a different way? I mean, I think it's, I hope that 360 feedback, so top down, bottom up, side to side, left, right, whatever, helps understand those decisions. Is that making any sense? I feel like I'm saying a lot of words and I don't know if I'm making sense. What would you say, Liz? I think um, really just talk about what Anita said. I've definitely, we because we have students, um, that are not in a senior RBT position. And I've, again, felt like, oh gosh, you know, I wonder if somebody's feelings are hurt. Does this person know so much more than me because they they are a student? And, and for me, I think it really does come from the top. I think that having this Dr. Becca's support and um, her being as, as open and honest as she is, um, you know, and acknowledging, hey, there are going to be hurt feelings. And there's a reason that we, uh, you know, we are operating in this way is really, really helpful. And I also wanted to just speak a little bit to what Laura said about, you know, being just an RBT mm -hmm. and, and even the language that folks use about, um, it, it makes it sound like it's a stepping stone and it doesn't have to be. Not everybody needs to go to grad school. That That is not when you've arrived or when you're good enough or you know enough or, I mean, it just isn't. Um, and, and it's hard. Um, Amanda says the flip side is that I've seen people turn down those roles because they don't want the added responsibility with peers. So, so yes. And I think that is where the well-crafted role has to be. So um, when Liz and Savannah were moved into the senior RBT position, uh, let me also say we offer the position and we talk very directly about the worst parts of it so that we want to make it sound kind of as bad as possible. So if you sign up for that and it's not going to be that bad, then you're stoked. 
don't try to make it sound amazing all the time because then people are like, oh, this is hard. We talked openly about you're going to go from being the person who gets checked in with all the time Mm -hmm. to being the checker inner. And I'm going to check in with you and I'm going to up that our relationship's going to change and evolve, but it's a lot, you're going to be the, the, the taker carer more than the recipient. Um, And we couldn't just add that on without having clear parameters about what those relationships look like, what they are, what they aren't working with Liz about how to set boundaries, just because somebody asks for something doesn't mean you get it. Right. And, and so how do we have those respectful, compassionate conversations um, make, so they get more check-ins with me. So if I'm not someone that you feel safe and secure with, this is going to be a really hard transition. So do we need to beef up our relationship? And not that it has to be me. That's just the way it is. Is there somebody else that can fulfill that for you? And it's also okay to say no, because you are going to be holding space for people, which means you cannot be billing 30 hours a week on top of this. We have to reduce your clinical load so that you have the capacity to hold space for others. So oftentimes the way I see this implemented is that it's something extra to do on top of your clinical work. And then you are the poorer into her, but you're not receiving as much. And so we really have to be balanced and say, if when you're doing X, you know, when you are taking care of 10 RBTs and, and there also has to be a limit, we've found that this, you know, can't be more than 10 for one person and the 10 is, is, is stretching it. You're going to meet with me every week. We're going to, you know, I do a lot more check-in reinforcement emails and such because I know you're not receiving it from so many other people. I mean, we've got to be really intentional about implementation. It cannot just be here's something extra to do. We have to teach the skills, reinforce the skills, model the skills, and then make sure that your workload is manageable, which means other things have to come off your plate. What else would you add, Liz? Um, yeah, I, and that too, for me was, you know, gosh, I, I love being in direct session. Um, you know, do I, do I want to not have 30 hours of direct billables every week? Um, that, that was definitely tough. And we have had people say no to not wanting the extra responsibility. Um, and I think that's great. I mean, that, you know, being open and honest, if you don't, don't want it, then you probably won't excel in it. And, I think that having that open communication is key. It's not always paid well. Many of us go into grad school. Yeah, so I, I think you're right. And when organizations are only focused on paying you based on your billable income, you do have to go to grad school to increase that billable income because it's going to max out. My view is how can we teach you other skills? So like Liz, is it okay to share kind of our current situation? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Liz um, is pregnant and moved back to New Jersey because her partner got out of the military. Liz is great. Like I'm a womb to the tomb kind of loyalty, (laughs) ride or die gal. So I I said to Liz, well, let's, what would you like, you know, we can come up with a um, virtual position. How do you want to do that? And so she's really learning practice management and billing and credentialing. I I will teach you if you are open to learning and I know that I can trust you because our values aligned, Hey, we'll open a clinic where you are. Like I'll find a way to make it work because, because we can teach you kind of anything. Behavior analysts rock at that if you're interested and open to it, but it's really hard to teach those shared values. And so Liz is able to do some of that support from afar and she doesn't have, I mean, so I think it's really about we are limited only by our imagination and our ability to think flexibly. And when we have those relationships, I think we see each other as humans and we're more willing and able to have those conversations about. And, and if Liz didn't want to do that, that would have been okay too. And if she does, I mean, I'm, I'm here for it. Let's, let's figure it out. And so we can teach folks skills other than ABA. There's other skills that are important, like practice management, like I don't know, a material maker, a resource manager, a the how to do peer support. Do you want to go to school to be a, a I mean, there's there's a SLIPA, right? A speech language pathology assistant. You just take a test for that. Like there's so many options. We truly are limited only by our ability to think about it. And it, we can, we, ABA has well, many mental, many health fields have gone awry thinking that one billable hour equates 
one, you know, this amount. And so um, there's so much more that goes into running an organization. And we want folks who are good at it doing that and, and teaching RBTs a variety of different things can help supplement your skill set, make yourself irreplaceable. Mm-hmm. And then you can't be replaced and, and that your income is going to, you know, match the skills and, the, and what you bring to the organization and, and show that you can bring more than just what's happening in that um, billable hour, I guess, is my long sort of definition. Or if you are really looking at increasing your salary and you want to go to grad school, find an organization that will let you do direct work. We have BCBAs that do 50% of their billing is direct. So so that's an option too. Do not let organizations pigeonhole you into something you don't want to do. Wow. You, that is a it was a buyer's market, right? You are valuable. Like Liz's slide that brought me to tears. You are valuable. Do not, if, if somebody doesn't want to meet you with what you want and they're your non-negotiables there is are other places that will um yeah helping folks it's a blessing and a curse to love what we do right it's a blessing because we feel really fulfilled and the curse is that we may end up doing it too much that we trend towards that burnout or not being healthy and well and that's where making sure that we're learning the skills at work that is the behavior analysis but also the other stuff that's um so important that's actually in many ways more important than the task list right so how do you set a boundary how do you um connect with a parent but not share too much how do you support an rbt while not coming out of your scope of competence or um knowledge or what you're supposed to be doing how do you how do you correct or give corrective feedback to a bcba as an rbt like these are important. How do you make sure that you say what you mean and mean what you say and that we're direct? And like, these are the things that we need to be teaching folks as well, not just how to use pre map principle and deliver reinforcement. That is important. And it's not the most important. Any other um, thoughts, feelings, reactions? It's okay if not. Um, and I also want to say thank you to Liz for presenting. You know, I think yeah, that this is, asking. this is another testament for me that you do feel secure in our relationship and that doesn't happen overnight. And that that's really each of us um, showing up genuinely, authentically and consistently for each other. That's how we learn. This is such a parallel process of what we ask our kids to do, right? So if Liz and I didn't have a relationship and I asked her to do something new, she's gonna say no. Or she's going to say yes and then be on one about it because she feels like she can't say no because we don't have this open relationship. Just like with our kids, we've got to help them feel safe and secure physically, emotionally, psychologically. So then we're asking them to do new things like have reciprocal conversations or imitate me. They feel safe enough to try something new because new things can be scary for all of us, not just kids with autism. And I see Jay saying thank you to Savannah, the whole team, Will's on here, Kelsey's been here, Jalen's been here. I mean, we really have a great team and that doesn't happen on accident it's each of us showing up each day for each other and it's not all happiness and rainbows right we we grow together in the tough moments and not everybody stays and that's okay uh let me say it different not everyone is a great fit for us at Del Mar and that's okay it doesn't mean they're good bad or otherwise it means that what we do we do really well and that we cannot shift from that so far that then we lose our values, right? The times that things have not gone smooth at Del Mar is almost 100% the times that I have bent what we do. I've flexed it too far from what we do that it, it didn't work. And so, um, and I think naming that, like I, you know, I mess up all the time. <laughs> like it certainly is. Um, what else do you think is, it's okay if, you know, not anything. I think that you said a lot of great things. I think just building those relationships all around, all in general, is is really key to a, a happy work environment. It has been for me at least, and I didn't learn that until I worked in Elmar. I appreciate that. I think when we are the humans, humaning with others, we have to 
I don't know. How do I say? We have to be aware of ourself, right? So if I am having a bad day and I'm showing up, whether it's to a therapy appointment, a supervision appointment, an ABA appointment, and I'm not in a great mood or, you know, I've had a rough start to the day, I'm going to bring that into the room. And I, that is, I cannot, that is dangerous and it's unfair. And so as the humans who are teaching other humans things, right? Remember that the light is on who? So in our supervision, the light's on Liz, I need to keep it there. And if I need to take a minute to get myself together, I need to do that. If I need to come in based on our relationship now, and I say, man, I had a really rough start to the morning. I'd like to sort of start today with like a deep breath. Does that feel okay with you? I'm also human in that moment. And she sees that I struggle and that she's important. I need to take a deep breath, put it on the shelf so we can focus on her. If I want her to do that for the kids, I need to do that for her. And if if um, we're asking other RBTs to do that, then Liz has to model that for them. And that model comes from me, right? So it's it's it. This isn't just a one person. This is like a whole systemic change. And all change starts with one person. I'm just me. I opened Delmar again only because there wasn't anywhere I wanted to work that prioritized my health and wellness in the same way that we do for the kids. 40 hours a week is far too long to spend miserable. Look, it doesn't mean things are easy all the time, but it does mean that I know the team's there. It's a real team. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.